Hey, welcome to Conversations, a podcast where we seek out intelligent voices, voices that have been pushed to the fringes or have been smeared or ignored. We try to understand if in fact they have valuable contributions to give, and we do this by implementing some simple principles. Participants agree on some basic rules of conversation, but most importantly, they must see the humanity in each other. At a time when polarisation is only increasing, while Western civilization is at serious threat of collapse, we believe these conversations are more important now than ever before. We hope you enjoy, but most importantly, we hope you take it upon yourself to have some of these conversations. Well, let's begin. Okay, so welcome to the fourth episode of Conversations. Uh, Today with me is Patrick Lawrence. Uh, Hi Patrick, how are you doing? Well, thank you very much. Good to see you. Good. Thank you very much for being on. Um, just for people who aren't aware, I'm sure many, hopefully many people will be aware of who you are. But um, Patrick is a journalist and writer, um, many years writing for The Nation and many other publications as well. Um, written four books, I believe, or is it is it up to five now? <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're beginning number six, actually. Oh, That's beginning right. number six. Great. Well, um, yeah, I mean, kind of part of what this is all about is getting to know a little bit about you for, for people who don't know, but I'd rather let you do that. But uh, just quickly before we kind of get started, uh, just explain a little mini ritual that we have on the, on the podcast, which is uh, just at the very beginning, I like to light a candle. Uh, long, story of why, <laughs> long story of why that is, but um, the whole idea is just to um, kind of, while the candle is burning, that we both treat each other like human beings, doesn't matter if we have political disagreements. Um, I will treat you like a human being. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. We... I just had a little bit of problem with the sound there. Hopefully, we're okay. But um, I'm sure we all will have no problems in in, in that. It's a, it's a nice gesture. I like it. But... Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, and and the other part of it is supposedly. Um, just a, kind of a little bit of light in a in an otherwise pretty dark time, so yeah. so hopefully um, kind of people can continue that going forward. But yeah, why don't we um, I guess get going with a little bit about kind of personal background. And I obviously spent uh, many years writing for the Nation, which we discussed previously is you know a publication we both um, respect greatly, and the, the history it has is absolutely you know second to none. So and just kind of maybe just talk us through your journalism and writing oh, background. I'm not, sure the, I'm not sure the nation as it's now constituted uh, measures up to its great history, but mm-hmm. that's another conversation. Mm-hmm. Where shall I start? Um, I mean, just maybe kind of brief summary of your, um, you know, your reporting, I guess you spent um, many, many years in Russia, I believe, is that correct? Oh, no, Asia. Okay, uh, let's. I'll, uh, I I get it now. Uh, I uh, I've been a journalist of lifelong, mm-hmm. career long journalist. Uh, started in New York uh, as an editor. Uh, edited uh, at uh, Business Week for a time, and then the New York Times, mm-hmm. with, with a little time at the FG in London in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I I began writing when I uh, well I always wrote while I was in New York I had kind of second jobs with the, mm-hmm. what, what then constituted a, a left press right uh, pretty active in African causes anti apartheid and all that mm-hmm. I I left New York in. 1981 uh, to begin writing and I went out to Asia. Mm -hmm. Uh, Far Eastern Economic Review, a wonderful magazine now, defunct. Um, On from that to uh, probably the most miserable year of my professional career uh, I spent at none other than Newsweek magazine. Under the Christian Science Monitor and then the Herald Tribune. Uh, and since the Trib was uh, and remains a 
well, the trip is no more. The, the, the trip as it was then was uh, half owned by the New York Times, half by the Washington Post. So since I was an old Times guy, uh, it was in a certain way like going home. But, um, and I had great years with the trip. Uh, first in Hong Kong, and then uh, I, I opened the bureau in Tokyo. Okay. What, 87, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, spent uh, seven years there. Did my first course on Japan. Um, uh, and um, I, I think uh, uh, subsequent to that, I became a commentator. I had done everything I could as a correspondent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm leaving some things out. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I think a, a rather big moment came in 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, I I had to conclude after that that uh, mainstream journalism had changed so drastically mm -hmm. in its relations with power. Political power, but also uh, corporate power, yeah. financial power by uh, Wall Street power by by virtue of uh, the ownership structure. Many of the owners of newspapers and so on were listed on Wall Street, not not to be ignored. But uh, yeah. Uh, and also, in a certain way, a sort of ideological power, right? Uh, mm. uh, I concluded um, that uh, one couldn't, well, to put it baldly, one one couldn't really remain entirely honest uh, mm. within mainstream media. It had mm. changed that much, and uh, um, getting out of it would, would bear costs considerable at the time uh, but I thought the only choice is to just leave the field altogether mm -hmm. or accept those costs mm -hmm. so that was a big moment uh, uh, 2001 uh, after the September 11th attacks uh, it seemed to me that uh, media um, uh, pledged themselves to political and ideological power, mm -hmm. very like the way they did during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm actually writing about this is my this is my next book. Mm -hmm. right? The press had a very bad Cold War and never recovered from it. Right. Um, and the one rather considerable consequence of that was its capitulation to power after 2001. Mm -hmm. So uh, since then, uh, I spent a little more time. I, I returned to the Herald Tribune. You know, mm -hmm. I, I edited the Asian edition. But it was it was done. It, it was over. Mm -hmm. I returned to the states, and I've been a columnist and commentator since then. Um, uh, published my fourth and fifth books uh, in 2010 and 2013, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the rest is you know well enough, such that we're we're talking. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I mean, um, part of my inspiration for wanting to talk to you, other than, you know, you have a, a you know, history that I, I deeply admire and thank, um, I'm thankful for. But um, my kind of, what I'm starting to realize is that it's, it's not just you or me that have kind of gone through this experience of, um, you know, we've tried to say something that was counter to the, the prevailing ideology at the time. And essentially, you know, there's, you know, people have been slowly kind of shunned out of the industry for trying to say anything like that. And I think what's kind of happened now is that we've reached this point where there's been so many people that have been shoved to the fringes that actually there's, you know, 
vast, you know, vast numbers of these people that actually have, you know, very valuable pieces to the puzzle of how everything works because, you know, every, every time a journalist leaves the industry, their story kind of goes untold really of why, um, you know, why they left and what story it was. And because usually those stories will contain, um, you know, essential elements, you know, of the bigger picture that, you know, might have influence elsewhere. Uh, and I think, you know, um, obviously you had the kind of the piece that um, I guess probably changed maybe the trajectory or, you know, how you were perceived or after you wrote the piece in, was it 2016 about the DNC leaks? 2017. Oh, 2017. My, uh, yeah, my apologies. Yeah, so, um, I mean, could we go a little bit into that piece and, you know, maybe first of all, of how it kind of caught your attention or why you kind of decided to... Yeah. Let me make a remark first on uh, uh, what you were saying earlier about um, people uh, leaving the mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, last night, uh, someone dear to me in the next room here um, uh, drew my attention to a piece on Consortium News, one of the best I ever wrote. And it was an analysis of Putin's, uh, President Putin's uh, State of the Union speech mm -hmm. uh, two days ago and, uh, and the, the plans he put, is now putting in place for, for constitutional revision, uh, uh, a new distribution of power within the leadership. The presidency becomes less powerful, the prime minister becomes more powerful. Uh, Pollution of power to the Duma, the legislature, and so on. It, it was a very coherent, uh, insightful, straight ahead sort of analysis by someone who mm -hmm. plainly understands Russia mm -hmm. adequately. You know? And I could not help but remark it was a first class piece of journalism. It could have been run on the front page of the New York Times, except mm -hmm. it wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just couldn't help but remark that what we get from the corporate press here mm -hmm. is just ideologically charged rubbish, uh, mm -hmm. dehumanization, um, uh, you know, comic book port uh, 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 portrayals of, of Russia and its leadership and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought to myself, that's a really responsible piece of journalism, and look where it's appearing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Consortium News, uh, I'm very mm -hmm. pleased to write there. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but look, uh, why was that piece there? You know, apologies to Consortium. But <laughs> why would we have to read that at Consortium and not in one of our mm -hmm. main, you know, powerful, as we call them, legacy newspapers? Mm -hmm. Shut. Mm -hmm. it, it suggested to me, it, it was confirmation uh, for me of something I've said for a long time. Um, and that is that alternative media, I don't like that term, we can go into why. Mm -hmm. But for, for the sake of shorthand, what we call alternative media bear an extraordinary responsibility in, in, in our society now. Way big used to, right? Uh, uh, and um, and it's important to recognize that it's a new landscape by way of media, right? Mm -hmm. uh, these major newspapers, the Times, the Wash Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, all of them, right? They're basically consuming themselves. They're mm -hmm. they're surviving on legacy uh, uh, and reputation. Mm -hmm. But they're not adding to the legacy or the reputation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, as I call it, it it's self-consumption. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like the snake consuming its tail or something. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, I think in years to come, uh, what we call alternative media, they will, they will be ever more important. Mm -hmm. There's 
I was just reflecting with a friend yesterday. Um, I'm reading, I had to write a column yesterday, right? Uh, I'm reading media that I wouldn't have touched with a pole 10 years ago, right? Uh, um, and, uh, you know, very good ones. The one I happen to be thinking of is called Moon of Alabama, a really excellent, uh, a really excellent publication, right? Um, I mean, one does have to go through these various media and determine reliability and you know, all, all that sort of thing. Some of them are more reliable than others. Moon of Alabama, MOA as it's called, uh, uh, is quite a reliable, responsible publication. The guy's got superb sources. Uh, others, uh, you know, not you know, one must be more careful. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, these sorts of publications, numerous of them, uh, are going to be ever more important mm -hmm. to keeping people informed. Mm -hmm. If you want to know what's going on uh, after the president of the Russian Federation gives a speech, you're not going to get it from the New York Times anymore. Mm -hmm. They're too much in the ideological game. This mm -hmm. is what I mean by capitulation to power, right? Uh, uh, and uh, Consortium News uh, uh, has no interest other than other than printing uh, uh, printing what what it knows to be so, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the late founder of Consortium had a lovely phrase: "We don't care what the truth is; mm -hmm. we just care what the truth is." Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's my that's my thought on the earlier part of your question. Now, you wanted to talk about that August. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say quickly. Um, we've had um, well, a couple of things. I guess things to note with what you're saying is that I think this year is probably going to be, or it's going to start changing very rapidly now because I think we've had this kind of um, or not. Uh, everything coming together of kind of several big stories so I mean mm. with Syria because what's happening well one factor is the podcasts are of this you know emerging market where mm. even though it's not as reliable as journalism and we shouldn't kind of depend on it for journalism you are seeing a much kind of uh, freer flow of ideas being discussed there than you are and so I think much, many more people are now becoming aware of certain issues that they hadn't been due to the media but then also um things like jeffrey epstein uh this the conflict in syria um there's so or there's various other kind of big stories that people have been asking questions and it's the the media's kind of even the media's treatment of bernie sanders so it's 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 you know so there's so many different little factions that are now um completely becoming completely distrustful that it's it's yeah they're just eating eating themselves like you said but yeah so um i guess yeah to kind of get back into the sort of 2017 and um you know with, with the with the dnc i guess with the thing with that story is that it's i mean we could spend a long time discussing it in its own but it, it fits in a kind of a, a much bigger story yeah. Okay, well, uh, um, I was writing on foreign affairs uh, mm -hmm. for the nation at the time, and um, uh, I was approached by this organization, some of your listeners will know, VIPS, uh, mm -hmm. Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a really distinguished group of people, mm -hmm. men and women, and senior spooks and technical people, and, all that. and uh, <laughs> retired, you know, uh, or or fired, mm -hmm. um, whistleblowers and so forth. Um, uh, and they had forensic evidence um, that the that what was by this time labeled uh, 
a Russian hack of the Democratic Party's mail. Mm -hmm. It was not a hack. It was a leak. Mm -hmm. It was a leak um, executed by someone with direct access to the computer systems uh, in, in question. Um, and they, they had forensic evidence of this coming, basically having to do with uh, the speed, the metadata uh, of the metadata, uh, you know, the, the label on, on, uh, on the uh, leak mm -hmm. indicated that it was downloaded at a certain speed. Mm -hmm. And that speed was not achievable over the internet. Mm -hmm. That speed was only achievable by a direct download mm -hmm. onto a memory key or something like that. Mm -hmm. Especially if, if it's being perpetrated in Ukraine or Russia or wherever it was alleged, it was even more unlikely to reach that speed. Right. Uh, so I took a train down to Washington and uh, set myself up in a hotel and, and reported for some while. Mm -hmm. um, very complicated. I'm not a te technical guy. Mm -hmm. I, I read those documents at the, at the same time or, you know, with the, the technical yeah. analysis. Yeah. Anyway, it was, a, their evidence was persuasive. Their line of logic was persuasive. Mm -hmm. These people included two technical directors from the NSA. Mm -hmm. We're talking about, you know, very distinguished Mm -hmm. uh, technical people mm -hmm. uh, on careers uh, and uh, I, I reported on their findings mm -hmm. uh, their findings were evidence to date right um, mm -hmm. I reported I reported it at the beginning of August late July early August mm -hmm of 2017. Uh, the story was published I think August 9th. Mm -hmm. uh, and I reported on their findings. Um, and uh, it began, uh, it, it opened, it was without question one of the more important mm -hmm. I, I have written. Mm -hmm over the long duration of my professional life. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, it, it absolutely, it, the clouds, you know, just opened. It was a, a very uh, loud, uh, disorderly, uh, in many ways unpleasant response peace prompted mm -hmm. on one side. Um, on the other side, it was greatly appreciated and supported by uh, many, many readers. Mm -hmm. It was the most read piece on the nation's website for nearly a month, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it caused me all sorts of uh, personal Difficulties. Uh, we don't need to go into those. But uh, um, the important thing is why all that happened. Mm -hmm. um, and the the answer is the, the VIPS findings had been available for some weeks. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, sin, my transgression is that I brought them into a, a, what is approximately a mainstream publication. Mm -hmm. I, I brought those findings into a magazine that is, has a very important place in the Democratic Party mm -hmm. constellation mm -hmm. universe. Right? That was the problem. Mm -hmm. 
And I learned uh, uh, over the next long while the extent to which with social media and so forth and this this rather radical ideological uh, streak in the mainstream Democratic Party, mm -hmm. uh, how easy it is to destroy a person's life and career. Mm -hmm. it, neither my life nor my career was destroyed, but they could have been. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has happened to others. Uh, this is very vicious, so. mm -hmm. uh, and um, my, uh, hang on, I've argued for a good long while, Donald Trump is quite odious and uh, a, a malign force. Mm -hmm. But he, he will come and go. Donald Trump will come and go. These ideological Democrats, with their, with their uh, rather pronounced streak of intolerance and so mm -hmm. forth, uh, rigidities and all the ornaments that hang off of that, the identity politics nonsense and so forth, uh, um, they are not going to go away. Mm -hmm. De, de, de Tocqueville, in the second volume of Democracy in America, mm -hmm. writing in the 1830s and started talking about what he called soft despotism. Mm -hmm. That's what we've got here, mm -hmm. right? That, that experience told me something. Never mind left, right, Democratic, Republican, or anything else. Mm -hmm. America, all together, the whole thing. Mm -hmm very intolerant, illiberal society. And that's what scares me more than Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. It's the radicalization of left and right and people, you know, anyone that's on the opposite side of the spectrum is, is a bigot or a fascist or a... Yeah, it really opened my eyes. It certainly confirmed my, it certainly confirmed the judgment I had made years earlier. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, there's, there's not much more to be accomplished mm -hmm. in mainstream media. The, the place one needs to occupy mm -hmm. is uh, outside, mm -hmm. right? On the margin, right? If I may quote the exquisitely vulgar LBJ, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you're either inside the tent pissing out or outside the tent pissing in. And it, it is time to be outside the tent. Mm -hmm. You know? and, and I think um, saying is, mm -hmm. but I think what you're saying also kind of fits into kind of a broader story of how the Democratic Party have seemingly well because they've become so closely aligned with uh, corporate power and Wall Street uh, they've also now kind of come into a alliance with the security establishment and the intelligence yeah. establishment and so I think, you know, what you kind of directly, you know, one of the first people to show this was that, I mean, the, the implication of, of what you wrote essentially is what became the, the controversy is that it, it countered the narrative of um, the DNC leaks, which showed how corrupt Hillary Clinton were, was um, it, it disproved the theory that it came from Russia, which was... I mean, it was fairly, it was patently obvious to many people on the outside, I believe. But I guess in, in America, it was something that was kind of swallowed up. Um, but now we're kind of seeing the implication of that because that narrative has gone to the point of uh, the recent Russiagate controversies. And so it's, it's, that, it's because of that, that idea uh, kind of persisting in the... In yeah. the the Russia Gate fable mm -hmm. <coughs> was concocted for a number of purposes. One was to uh, prevent Trump from becoming president. The other was to to uh, protect the net, to protect the Democratic Party from the scandal that was in the 
uh, revealed in, in, in the purloined mail. Uh, the, the question immediately became not what was in the mail. We've never had a public discussion of what was in the mail. Mm-hmm. We're talking about who delivered the mail, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Ridiculous. Um, uh, let's continue on. Now. Mm-hmm. So I guess um, what well, we've discussed the the the, the slight fall fallout. May, may, may I interrupt, Mark? Mm-hmm, please. I sort of lost my apropos there for a second. Uh, um, the, the Russia Gates fable, the mm-hmm. great tall edifice of Russia Gate, mm-hmm. right, uh, in in the course of between 2016, when the mail was leaked, mm-hmm. uh, to leaked, not hacked, uh, mm-hmm. and, um, uh, by 2000, by late 2017, somewhat after I, I wrote my piece for the nation, mm-hmm. it became what I called it in a consortium column. It's just too big to fail. Too many people are invested mm-hmm. in this. You have the Democratic Party uh, leadership. Mm-hmm. You have the media. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have the intelligence apparatus. Mm-hmm. And you have law enforcement, all very heavily invested in in a, a, a quite flimsy mm-hmm. uh, gathering of uh, false facts and disinformation, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. The holes in the holes in the whole thing are are, are many, right? uh, but it is too too many people. Have an interest in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just discussing this last night. Uh, I'm not sure we will ever be permitted to see thoroughly into what happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's it would be too consequential. If mm-hmm. we, uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things. That I think it, it's and I know you've I think you've written about this and you've kind of. I think one of it's one of your books, kind of beyond. Uh, well, the idea is after exceptionalism, I believe. So, but it's, it's yeah that. Um, it's not a book. It's a long essay. Oh, okay. My apologies. Um, well, but, actually, my last yeah. book, Americans after the American Time No Longer. Uh-huh. Oh, time. But, yes. That's sort of like after exceptionalism. Mm-hmm. I've just published an essay called. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But I guess it's um, what you, what I believe you touch on is the idea that America is essentially in, in kind of decline at the moment. And this, it seems to be that, you know, this whole thing is going to kind of eat, kind of eat away at America's kind of global presence and place in the world. If it, because it's, it's, and we're already seeing this happen with, um, you know, America's already slowly getting pushed out of the Middle East even though it'll never really, it's, it hasn't been portrayed that way in the media, but they've had failure after failure in the Middle East and they're slowly losing their influence. Iraq has completely gone to the alliance of China and Russia yeah. after all, all the time that we, you know, had, had fought there and all that, all the devastation there. Um, so it's, yeah, it seems to be, unfortunately, this not a very bright future for, um, unless there's... Yeah, I, I wrote about uh, this question of decline mm-hmm. in my last book. Right? Uh, to, to, give the, to give your listeners a little background, it was, it was sort of a not done to discuss American decline maybe 20 years ago. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, one was labeled a quotation marks declinist, you know. Mm-hmm. That's... that's that's a touch like uh, calling somebody a conspiracy theorist now. Mm-hmm. All you need to do is label them, and you don't have to have any further discourse. Mm-hmm. They're just dismissed. Right? Uh, well, I wasn't a declinist, and I, and I addressed this question in my last book. Decline is not a fate. Mm-hmm. It is a choice. 
we had choices to make um, prior to September 11th, but certainly after. Mm -hmm. I, I date the end of the American century to the September 11th attacks. Mm -hmm. Other people have other dates, but uh, I, I date the end of the American century to then. Now, I reckoned we had 25 years to make some quite serious mm -hmm. choices concerning our place in the world, concerning questions such as multipolarity and so on, concerning the, uh, the uh, exceptionalist consciousness that we have uh, mm -hmm. derived from our history. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and if we did not address those questions, mm -hmm. we left them on... Answering them wrongly, it would be one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we did not ex address those questions, not making a choice would constitute a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we would, in, in, in that case, be choosing decline. Mm -hmm. Decline is a choice, not a fate. Mm -hmm. Am I coming over clearly on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we are, you know, I, in, in the book, I said, look, I don't have a crystal ball, but I give us 25 years. Mm -hmm. I, uh, and we're well into that period now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we are making the wrong choice. Mm -hmm. We're making over and over the wrong choice because we are choosing to insist upon our singularity in the community of nations. Mm -hmm. when our singularity, our exceptional status mm -hmm. can no longer uh, it can no longer be defended, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it will no longer hold. The mm -hmm. 21st century is a multipolar century. The, one of the key, absolutely key features of our time is going to be the achievement of parity between West and non-West. Mm -hmm. That's what China and Russia are saying mm -hmm. in a single sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's no way to imagine that out of existence. There's no way to pretend it's not so, and, right? And we just insist that it is not so. Mm -hmm. that, that's choice. Mm -hmm. That's a wrong choice. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and and so now, uh, I'm still not a declinist because I think I think the question boils down, comes down to what we decide to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but and we are deciding on the first off. Yeah, and I think you know, in in context of that, there are glimmers of hope um, or positive signs here and there. But uh, there, I mean, they're still small things at the moment i guess that you know the, the problem is still a giant one that has to be confronted but pessimism of the mind <laughs> optimism of the will mm -hmm. <laughs> <Rough shoot. laughs> I'll, I'll use that going forward <laughs> um i guess the whole um the dnc leaks and everything we've been discussing um wouldn't be possible without kind of getting into julian assange which I was very interested to get into with you. Um, personally, I, I feel like um, he's at his, the whole case is kind of symbolic of uh, a much wider thing. It kind of represents America in a nutshell almost. It's because he is almost, to me, I see him as this kind of ultimate figure of free, free speech. And um, I almost contrast it with uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn of, you know, when he came over to the United States, it was praised and, you know, we were congratulating how, uh, you know, we're tolerant of freedom of speech or we protect freedom of speech. And now you have this kind of flip where, or even Edward Snowden, who's now in exile in, in Russia, it's the kind of the complete uh, inverse of, of what's the, what the, the history had been before. Um, but yeah, just maybe, I guess, I don't know, with Julian Assange, there's so many things that we could get into, but, um, you know, how, how do you think he fits into the whole picture? 
I think there are a couple of things to look at with the song. I think one is um, where power, state power, mm -hmm. situates itself in this case, right? Um, state power, sovereign power, is in the Assange case situa situating itself above the law, right? Mm -hmm. It has a relationship with the law because it is the maker of laws and the enforcer of laws. Mm -hmm. but the maker of laws is, is it places itself outside the law. Mm -hmm. It's not paradoxical. Um, that's what we're looking at with Assange. You watch the proceedings from his court hearings since he was arrested, they're pretty scary, okay? Now, that principle um, applies not only to Julian Assange, we all need to watch that. Mm -hmm. We all need to take note uh, of the fact that state power places itself above its own laws, okay? Um, the, the second aspect of this, uh, I, I happen to be writing a, a, an essay on this now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this, this, uh, I, I see Assange as a kind of archetype. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, a, a very great deal has been written about Assange and, and press freedom and mm -hmm. things like that. And all those things need to be said, but I think we need to see him in, in a more profound way mm -hmm. as an archetype. Uh, and what I'm saying here is as a scapegoat, mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a, 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 a social mechanism mm -hmm. through which uh, various kinds of uh, political social cultural pressures are relieved mm -hmm. you know, um, is the embodiment of a wider yeah. phenomenon think about this what was assange doing what was assange doing this is what i, I yeah. he was I, telling the truth essentially about what was doing assange was doing in a very pure way exactly what any ambitious journalist wants to do mm -hmm. He was uncovering un inconvenient truths mm -hmm. and publishing them. Is that not journalist nirvana? That's that's the highest achievement any journalist can aspire to. He's done right? the journalism then. Right. That's right. Now, uh, what has what have journalists done? Uh, they are they they've hounded him out of town, right? What does it mean that the man who is uh, doing what all aspiring, properly aspiring journalists want to do, mm -hmm. he's a scapegoat because journalists cannot do that anymore. Mm -hmm. They are not allowed to uncover unpleasant truths. Mm -hmm. I uncovered one, mm -hmm. you uncovered one, mm -hmm. look what happens. Yeah. Uh, so in this way, he's a kind of archetypal scapegoat, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a very common word. But I, your listeners uh, may wish to know I, I'm using it in the way a, a, a rather honored uh, scholar. Uh, Is that Carl Jung by any chance? No, uh, uh, <laughs> Rene, Rene Girard. Um, okay recently deceased Rene Girard, he taught at Stanford for many years. Mm -hmm. He developed this concept of the archetypal scapegoat mm -hmm. and the function of the scapegoat mm -hmm. in society, right? Mm -hmm. As a way of relieving social, political, cultural pressures, what have you. Right? Mm -hmm. in, this case, in this case, you have a profession that can no longer perform its, its task. It, it is, it is 
prevented from performing its quintessential task, mm -hmm. um, attacking someone who still managed to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Well, uh, I've I've looked into archetypes a lot in because I I'm very interested in in psychology and psychoanalysis, psychoanal and it's an idea that comes from Carl Jung, but it's also something. It's it's the idea that the uh, it's the the fall on the fringes. It's like the uh, the the people on the outskirts of society. Uh, it's the it's the kind of the canary in the coal mine type idea. Is that the, the these people on the fringes are the ones that are on the you know on the barriers of truth essentially and you know when they come to return to the the kingdom or where or where knowledge is is they get attacked for because yeah. they're so different to what we what is yeah. uniform in our in our thinking because yeah. you know they're, they're the people they always come from the fringes and if you look at julian assange he was kind of this punk hacker um you know, rebellious kid from Australia or, you know, but, uh, and then he's the one that's, you know, completely outside of the system that we're, you know, the, that we're living in. And then he's the one to expose these. Um, and it's something you see with, yeah. You liked Assange. Remember when, mm -hmm. when he first started releasing documents, it was, it was going to be a very big thing for journalism, right? Uh, uh, everybody was going to be able to kind of open the, you know, lift the lid on, you know, it was going to be a wonderful new mechanism available to all journalists. A lot of enthusiasm. Everybody must be. Well, what happened? They turned on him. Why? My answer? Uh, because it, it soon enough became clear that Assange was going to challenge too much. The uh, fixed relationship that journalism has to political power, mm -hmm. that was not tolerable. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you, mm -hmm. where will I find in Jung writings on uh, scapegoats? I'd be very interested. Um, well, it's, I'd have to, well, the, the famous one, I don't know if I have it here. Oh, it's not, I'll just grab, it's, well, the Red Book, I believe, I haven't, it's, it's not next on my reading list, but um, Jung's one of those people that's so complex that's, I don't know, his ideas might be a bit uh, varied, but Jung is extremely interesting. Um, yeah, I recommend getting into him, but maybe, yeah, maybe try the Red Book, or I'm sure possibly even like a reader. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. to, to kind of explain his ideas um, might be because I've heard that his writing is very um, kind of convoluted and difficult for because he's he's someone that's very fascinating he had this kind of psychiatry background but then became interested in religion and alchemy and instead of kind of dismissing it as um, you know nonsense he, he looked at it, it truly seriously and then in, in starting to, because he used to, um, he used to, he used to be a doctor with uh, patients with schizophrenia and he um, would listen to their dreams. And so when he listened to their dreams, uh, he found that the, the, the narratives of their dreams had very, um, had a lot of similarities to religious stories. And so when he started to examine the whole field of religious stories, he started to notice that they were, there were patterns that existed in all of them that are shared. Mm -hmm. And this is what the idea of an archetype is, that all of us as human beings have the same, no matter where we're born, um, we have shared patterns of existence. For example, the fact that uh, we're all born into a society, uh, the archetype of society is a father figure. And the, so this is why you get the motif in lots of movies and books of the evil father. Uh, you see a lot in, in Star Wars is kind of that, that concept of, or even in The Lion King, it's the, the child, which is the incarnation of, um, that's the, the archetype of the hero or the logos or the truth. It, it, he's, he's born and he's in, a, he's in a corrupted society where you know, there's something going wrong. There's a, a bad king or an evil king in place. 
and he has to go and rescue his his dead father or the good father from the depths of the underworld so if you look at the lion king story he goes off into the jungle and he you know has these gallivants with timon and pumba and then he comes and he rescues the king you know brings the kingdom back to all its glory um so it's it's that that kind of idea so um yeah that's just one of the but so all of the all the different archetypes um emerge in different characters or different all the patterns that we experience in our life emerge themselves in in patterns so uh, nature is usually like the the mother figure or the you know so this is why we say mother nature for example or um, and and the kingdom is all like the you know the 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 kind of end goal is to have that perfect union between uh the the kingdom and nature or the masculine and the feminine elements or um of society and, and the masculine and feminine not just in a gendered way it's a uh they're symbolic of of other things it's not just um that but it, it's it's very interesting and very anyway let's <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um so i guess with um with what julian assange kind of one of the truths that he told was was the corruption at the, the dnc with the 2016 emails um, yes. so what, i mean what do you think are the you know because that's i guess once you wrote that story like you said the attention was on you or the messengers and we never really discussed the emails we never really discussed uh you know the, the implications of the report that you wrote so what do you think those those implications are you mean the content of the mail yeah and and the kind of the the consequences of, of your reporting and what what you know what it really reveals uh, i think um it's it's pretty plain that the mainstream you know the the democratic party leadership mm -hmm. actively worked to sabotage the Bernie Sanders campaign, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's never really been out there as a major topic. Mm -hmm. There was a lawsuit mm -hmm. filed, and the DNC's quite remarkable defense was um, that it had a right to favor Hillary Clinton. <laughs> you can't say that with a straight face, can you? <laughs> concerns the question of change in America. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know uh, that uh, America is in need of various rather important reforms mm -hmm. uh, the world's changing we need to change with it mm -hmm. but uh, it, the question is whether uh, our country is capable of mm -hmm. change right? and to me the question that to me the, the truth that emerges from the mail hack mm -hmm. is that uh, entrenched powers mm -hmm. are, are capable of blocking any authentic effort mm -hmm. to, to bring fundamental change to the American system. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a really we can in, in short, I, I remember back when when um, uh, Al Gore lost the won the election, but it was taken from him mm -hmm. by the Supreme Court. I remember thinking, this country does not have the capacity to self-correct. Mm -hmm. uh, power is too deeply entrenched with special interests, mm -hmm. uh, un unelected special interests. Uh, and what it means is we are not capable 
the question of whether this nation can change mm -hmm. is is a very grave question, and there's much to suggest it can't. Mm -hmm. And if it can't, we're done. Okay? Uh, now, the the 2020 election is going to be another test of this, mm -hmm. of this very matter, right? In, in my judgment, <coughs> uh, the Democratic leadership will not, under any circumstances, allow a figure such as Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. to get the nomination. Mm -hmm. They they sabotaged him in 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, we had Russiagate as the consequence. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still stuck with that. Um, and I don't really think Russiagate will do it this time. Mm -hmm. um, but so the question is how they will do it. How, how will they sabotage Sanders this time, though? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's an interesting question. And we've already seen various. Well, it's, it's a question of, Tarek, it's a question of whether the United States is capable mm -hmm. of serious change or not. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it goes back to a, a problem that, like you mentioned, persisted probably. You know, people have started talking about this since the 70s, I believe. You know, I, I remember watching old C-SPAN videos of people talking about money and money in politics and how it's, you know, becoming this big problem. And it was, you know, considering compared to what is going on now, it was probably a much uh, smaller problem. But, you know, you, you had journalists going up there and, and discussing how, you know, money was, was damaging politics. And now... Yeah. Direct. There's there, money. Money in politics now is a is a is a cancerous disease uh, uh, with with no antidote apparently, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because the people who would have to pass legislation mm -hmm. uh, to counter this problem mm -hmm. are the ones who are taking the money, right? Uh, that's what I mean about the in inability to self-correct. I remember when, and we're not taught, what we're doing is denying, right? Uh, I remember when I was covering the Japanese, uh, um, they had just the, the enormous sums of money were going into politics. It was really a very bad situation, right? Mm -hmm. And it was called money politics uh, after the Japanese craze, right? The money politics. And all the Western correspondents wrote about money politics, you know, as if, wow, this is a really awful thing. Look at these Japanese. It's a mess over here, right? Uh, and I remember thinking, are we kidding? <laughs> we, an American correspondent is coming over here and saying, oh, wow, the Japanese are in trouble. They've got money in politics. Yeah. <laughs> the point here is willful blindness. Mm. Yeah about it anymore mm -hmm. in the paper and uh, mm -hmm. the, the reports are how much money somebody raised in the last three months mm -hmm. but i think it's um it's got to this really critical point now because what you're seeing is that you know these special interests or the military interests are acting completely uh in a rogue fashion on in the international stage you know I mean, this this thing that we we've seen with Syria, where a United Nations body was weaponized to sell the case for war, and you know, official documents from the and um, you know, the fact that this is this can be done, and it's just one thing on a long list of um, you know, international law being broken on a yeah. on, on a on a very big level, um, and I think you know, it's it's got to the stage now where the rest of the world. Is, has finally become powerful enough to say um, we're not going to tolerate this American interference and or American kind of messing around with international law. That's uh -huh. my understanding of the situation at the moment. Do you want to say, okay, so we just took a little pause there, but uh, we're back for part two. Um, so just kind of a last, Thing, uh, I kind of wanted to get into I guess um, or maybe a couple of things um, and part of part of these conversations is that I don't want to be avoiding I guess difficult co topics because 
you know, certain people are afraid of being called a, a sad apologist or a, client, a conspiracy theorist or, or whatever. Pay no attention to any of them. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, and, and I, sh I share the, I believe I share the opinion that you do in terms of when I was looking at the WikiLeaks documents at the time and all the, all the um, evidence that was coming out and the statements I heard from Julian Assange was that even though it hadn't been confirmed, I had strong suspicions that the DNC leaked what you know what it was a leak and that it came from seth rich um i mean you know can you can you speak of anything regarding seth rich that's kind of in your that you've kind of come to know that isn't maybe very well known to the to the wider public about his seth i i don't really know that much about seth rich uh, i know what your average person is able to read mm -hmm. uh, uh it it is uh a, a, a very major, major transgression mm -hmm. to mention his name. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't even do it, yeah. No. It's, I mean, which is kind of evidence enough that we, right, sh and, we should be looking into it, right? Yeah. And, and the standard trope was uh, uh, anyone who mentions Seth Rich's name in connection with the DNC thing, mm -hmm is criticized for being cruel and unkind and thoughtless uh, as regards Seth Rich's grieving parents. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the, that's the hope. Uh, I don't know that much about Seth Rich. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think one has to be very careful mm -hmm. not to make a mistake, not to make the mistake to fall into the trap that uh, the Russia Gators Mm -hmm. have which is to make statements without evidence mm -hmm. can't do that yeah but, as journalists especially yeah yeah um i don't know mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's something that's worth as, well th there's a lot of, there are your usual there's your usual collection of peculiar circumstances mm -hmm. right? uh, why didn't the fbi take on that case mm -hmm. considering Rich's position in the DNC. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps there was a good reason for that, but I haven't heard it. Mm -hmm. um, it was left to the Metropolitan Washington Police Force. Mm -hmm. Now, the Metropolitan uh, Washington Police Force later uh, the, the contents of Rich's computer mm -hmm. were rather may, may, mm -hmm. have been rather key to things. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Metropolitan Police in Washington then reported that they lost Seth Rich's computer. Mm -hmm. My understanding, mm -hmm. I haven't interviewed any police in Washington, but my understanding is that uh, the computer has been reported as lost. Mm -hmm. what? What in the world is that all about? Yeah. Right? Um, uh, one understands that uh, Rich was in one or another capacity in touch with WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. We don't, uh, again, I, I haven't reported this story. I'm just telling you what uh, I yeah. have. Um, if, if that is so, it remains to be answered, well, what was he in touch about? Mm -hmm. we, can't, we can't jump to conclusions and say he was about, those, those contacts were about the leaked mail. We don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, there are all sorts of things floating around out there. Mm -hmm. I, I've been told by someone whose authority I trust that um, it appears Rich was had reached a certain moment with WikiLeaks. He had given them he had given them the mail. Mm -hmm. This theory runs, uh, and was now asking for money mm -hmm. uh, to supply more. Uh, that's what one thing one hears. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, 
uh, Cy Hirsch was captured on audio, mm. a very unethical thing to do. Right? Somebody was recording Cy Hirsch really? in a conversation, and he didn't know he was recording. Oh, I didn't, yeah. I, and I, I, he says in the conversation mm -hmm. that he's been talking to a law enforcement officials. His sources are very, very reliable and mm -hmm. science, exceedingly careful to protect his sources. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> he's apparently saying on this audio uh, that the FBI, I believe it was the FBI, um, uh, has evidence that Rich was the responsible party. Mm -hmm. But again, Tarek, uh, uh, all, of, all of this must be placed in square brackets. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, but no, of course. I just, I, think, I just feel like it's, it's one of those things that I think people, we should no longer be skirting around these issues and hopefully just being able to just discuss them more openly in a kind of in a, just in a sensible way of, you know, two journalists that say, okay, we, you know, we need evidence to make certain statements, but we can, you know, we can try and, you know, have a normal conversation without it being this inflammatory. Yeah. Now, this inflammatory another, thing. another dimension of this, um, there are at least two people claim quite credibly mm -hmm. to know how the mail got to WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. One is Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. The other is Craig Murray, who says he acted as a, a, a retired a British diplomat, mm -hmm. who says he uh, was a, a, a kind of go-between in in the conveyance of the mail, I, I think that's his situation, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and he has made that clear. Mm -hmm. Now, at no point during the uh, what passed for an investigation mm -hmm. by the Mueller people or any of that, if you have two people who know, in one case, Assange. Mm -hmm. Black and white knows how. Mm -hmm. uh, in the other case, claims rather credibly to them, mm -hmm. and you don't interview them. Mm -hmm. You have to begin concluding. It's not hard to conclude this uh, that they really didn't want to know. Mm -hmm. You know, there were certain things that just don't want to be known. Mm -hmm. And uh, you and I don't know a very great deal about Seth Rich. Mm -hmm. Depending on the outside and talking about a certain amount of circumstantial, suggestive, mm -hmm. uh, suggestive knowledge and so on, right? We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but one gets the impression that the authorities don't want to know. Mm -hmm. right? uh, or even I would say they don't want other people to even uh, journalists to even think about the question because we have that weaponization of the word conspiracy theory and yeah. if you even if you dare to ask the question you're going to be thought of as a madman yeah I mean somebody remarked on social media some time ago I can't remember who we now live in an age when um, uh, when uh, the the media a actively doesn't want information, you know, the media charged charged with conveying information mm -hmm. uh, is is actively desires to prevent the, the publication of information. You get the idea. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing a very good job saying that, right? Uh, um, but uh, you know that's that's where we are our our mm -hmm. world. Mm. And I guess this is also this is just tangential. It's not uh, anything that that black or white. But uh, I don't know if you're aware. But I remember looking at the time. Um, Seth Rich was actually 
a, a you know in favor of bernie sanders and oh, well, I think, I think, no, no. yeah so i guess you know i think you know if you were to speculate as to possible motivation would be he saw that this corruption was taking place and how um you know the party was rigging the 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 primary against him and you know that could have been a motivating factor but and that's what there's other various things and you mentioned julian assange you know we talked about him as being kind of this archetype of journalism uh interestingly i feel like you know it was the it was archetypical too because it was the moment of you know his life is on the line as a journalist um but even yet he refused to he very strongly hinted that it was seth rich but he did the most journalistic thing uh from you know the best ethical journalistic thing was you know we protect our sources how did he suggest strongly suggest it was Seth Rich. Uh, there is a interview um, that it's mentioned and um, I, I can't, he, he just says something along the lines of, you know, the, the, the interviewer asks something about Seth Rich mm-hmm. uh, and Julian Assange doesn't mention him by name but says, yes, we are very concerned about our, our sources or um, so he, he kind of uses language that says, yeah. you know, it, it, I'll, I'll send you the clip. Um, it's, it's only kind of a two minute interview, but he, he kind of just says, you know, we're, we're strongly worried. But then he says, he kind of explains why he's not naming anyone to say that we as an organization are receiving, you know, we want to receive information at the highest level. Um, it, it's, well, I'm paraphrasing, but it, it's not in our interests to reveal who our sources are ever because you know if if seth rich was to be murdered in in this circumstance it puts a very chilling effect on on future whistleblowers so i think that's why he was taking that approach um and and, you know from an ethical journalism point of view that is what he should be doing because um but i guess maybe in, in this case there there is maybe more of a public interest to actually have the identity of the person revealed. But, um, and this is, I guess, the other thing with the Julian Assange trial and, and the, the lack of um, the, the decline of freedom of speech is that his charges are superseding. So he will not be able to um, raise a public, public interest defense for what any of the actions that he did. And, you know, it's, I don't think there will even be a, a jury made up of, of people it will be um, this appointed, you know, jury of judges. I believe I forget the the specific term. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is there anything you wanted to add to that, or should we? No, I think we're good on that topic. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, um, thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, I think a really important conversation. I wish this. I hope this uh, project. That goes forward and remains a, a really sound contribution. You know? Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, well, we'll end it there. Thank you very much.